Good morning. As always, we want to acknowledge to our Father and our God in heaven that we are grateful for all of his love, mercy, and blessings. Uh, an old song uh, exhorts us to count your many blessings, name them one by one, and if in fact we counted our blessings, I believe that the blessings we fail to number would be more than the ones that we are able to number because God blesses us abundantly every day, all through the day, uh, every day of every week. And he has yet to bless us because we are deserving. God remains the good God that he is, even though we try his patience uh, we frustrate his grace and we provoke him to wrath. Yet the psalmist has declared in Psalm 98 verse 4, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. When you think about God's goodness and uh, his forbearance and all of the things about God that make him God, uh, I believe the natural reaction is to praise him uh, for being the good God that he is. And for all of God's blessings, we ought to be eternally grateful. We want to direct your attention again this morning to Genesis chapter 4, to the text that was read into our hearing. We want to read again there verse number 9. Genesis 4 verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Based on the exchange as recorded here in Genesis chapter 4 between God and Cain, we want to use this morning as a subject, where is your brother? And as we consider the text that we have before us here in Genesis chapter 4, uh, we find Cain in a similar situation as to the one of his father, Adam, in chapter 3. And prayerfully, you remember the sermon from uh, last Sunday from chapter 3, where are you? Adam and Eve in chapter 3 were confronted and questioned by God concerning their wrong, and both of them attempted to shift the blame for what they had done. Cain, on the other hand, when confronted and questioned by God, chose to sulk in silence. Now, as we noted last Sunday, God never asks questions for the purpose of seeking information. God asks questions to promote introspection. Cain was a man who needed to take a good look at himself. And we know this because of what the Bible says there in verse 5. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. One of the things we know about God is that God is just and right in all that he does. So if there was a problem with God and Cain, then we know by default who the problem lies with. Cain was the problem, not God. When we look at the idea that Cain was very angry, the grammatical construction describing the intensity of Cain's anger here in Genesis 4 verse 5 it is akin to what we read in Genesis 34 7 uh, about the sons of Jacob when they found out that Shechem had defiled their sister. Well, well, they weren't just a little upset that they were uh, man, they were outraged at how their sister had been treated. Well, the same thing could be said about Cain in Genesis chapter 4. Cain was outraged at his being rejected and Abel being ex uh, accepted. 
And, and, and there are two observations that we want to make here. Uh, the first of these is that anger, when allowed to run unchecked, moves one to act irrationally and act dangerously. Hey, have you ever done something out of anger? If you allow your anger to run unchecked, you will do things that you know better than. People will try to reason with you, and if you let your anger get the better of you, you won't even listen to reason. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, the Apostle Paul exhorts us, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Now, now what did Paul mean by this, be angry and do not sin? When we are angry, we are more inclined to listen uh, to devilish counsel and to act devilishly. Notice what he said, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. It, deal with your anger a, as soon as you are able. Don't, don't just sit around and stew in your anger. You, you ever sat around and got good and mad? I, I, I mean, something happened Monday at work and you go home Monday night and you just stew over it. And, and by Tuesday, you, I mean, you just ready. I, I, I hope somebody say something to me this morning because I'm going to tear this place apart. Hey, well, Paul is saying, be angry and don't sin. Don't give place to the devil. Paul understands when we get angry, the devil can have a good conversation with you because you have a mind to listen to some devilishness. Uh, you know, the devil just come to you and, and any unreasonable thing he said, well, because I'm angry, uh, I'm more inclined to go along with it. The second observation uh, 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 that we want to make here is what was the nature of Cain and Abel's relationship prior to the event of chapter 4? Now, we aren't told, and speculation is speculation, but consider that one's character, and the text certainly infers that Cain had some character issues, consider that one's character is not fabricated instantaneously by one event. Circumstances only reveal what my character already is. Now, now, what I said was, this one thing didn't just make Cain fly off the handle. I, I would venture that Cain and Abel didn't have the best of relationships even before this happened. Now, now you've heard the term sibling rivalry, and, and, and it's not hard to see that maybe Abel was considered the good son. You know, Abel was the one that just did what he should have been doing when he was supposed to be doing it. But Cain was that one that, uh, you know, you just had to talk to sometime. He, Cain was that one that needed, needed a little more uh, 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 exhortation to, to, to walk the straight and narrow. And maybe the case is that Cain takes exception with Abel because Abel is viewed as the good son. Now, now all of that's not there in the text, but, but I don't think it's a stretch uh, 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 to, to see that there must have been some issue with Cain and Abel even before uh, uh, what we uh, uh, read here in, in the verses before us. You know, you just don't fly off the handle and kill your brother uh, uh, over a sacrifice. That's, that, that's kind of a, an extreme reaction. I, you know, it's extreme to kill your brother in any circumstance, but uh, I don't think he killed him just because this one time, uh, you know, God accepted his sacrifice and uh, accepted Abel's sacrifice and didn't accept Cain's. When we look at uh, uh, Genesis chapter 4, God attempted to reason with Cain. In verses 6 and 7, so the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Now, remember, God is not asking him because he doesn't know why he's angry. God trying to get Cain, look, you, you need to stop and think because you, you're about to run into some territory that you really don't want to go into. And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? Now, what God is telling him, look, I'm not playing favorites here. I accepted Abel because Abel did what he was supposed to do. And if you do what you're supposed to do, I would accept you too. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door 
and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, even though God attempted to reason with Cain, it's hard to reason with somebody who lacks integrity and is full of anger. And let me tell you, when God can't reason with you, you are beyond being reasoned with. Now, Cain disregards God's warning and murders his brother. Now, God, as he did with Cain's parents in chapter 3, when they were wrong, confronts Cain with a question. Now, in verse 9, the Lord says, where is Abel, your brother? Now, appreciate, God had full knowledge of what had happened. He, and he had warned Cain of the consequences of not stewarding his anger. But I believe we gain further insight into Cain's character uh, by, the, by the way he responded to God's question. Now, remember back in chapter 3, Adam, who first tried to shift blame, remember Adam said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit. Now, reluctantly, he admitted his guilt, even though he didn't accept responsibility. The woman you gave me, she, she gave it to me, and I ate. Well, well, yeah, I did what you said, but it's not my fault. If you hadn't put her here and she hadn't offered it to me, I wasn't the one over there fooling around uh, uh, on that tree. Well, Cain was a little different. Cain lies to God. Uh, in, in verse 9, notice what he says, I don't know. But then he had the gall to ask a question uh, of his own. Am I my brother's keeper? God declares Cain's guilt with another question that is really an accusation. In verse 10, what have you done? Now, again, God not asking for information. When, when, when God says, what have you done? He really asking Cain, do you appreciate the gravity of what you have done? Do, do you understand how, how you have messed things up by what you have done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Interestingly enough, the question asked of Cain in Genesis 4.10 is the same question that God put to his mother back in Genesis 3, verse 13. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? Now, again, God not asking Eve, what did you do? I know what you've done. That's why I came here to talk to you. Do you appreciate the gravity of what you have done? Do, do you understand where you are now that you have disobeyed? Uh, uh, what I commanded you. And even as Adam and Eve were not acting in his name when they ate uh, uh, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Cain was not acting in his name throughout the events uh, uh, of chapter 4. Now, when we look here at chapter 4, uh, in, in verse number 3, the Bible says there, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. I, I submit to you, number one this morning, that Cain failed to honor God. Now, some, when looking at Genesis chapter 4, would assert that the difference between acceptance and rejection was the fact that Cain didn't bring a blood, a blood offering. Now, that may have been part of the problem, but, but, but I think the weight of Bible evidence says to us uh, uh, that the real problem was Cain himself. And, and when you, there, there's a problem with me, it doesn't matter what I bring to God if, they, if I'm wrong. You, you can't bring God a right offering in, in the wrong frame of mind. One of the things we know is that God spoke to Cain and Abel concerning the sacrifice. Now, we know this because in Hebrews 11, verse 4, the Bible says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he, had obtained, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he being dead still speaks. Now, notice what the Bible says about what Abel offered. He offered it by faith. 
Now, every Sunday, uh, you hear me quote Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For something to be an act of faith, it must be done in response to what God has commanded. By faith, Abel offered. If you go back and read Hebrews 11, every time it says somebody did something by faith, God had spoken to them about what they were supposed to do. By faith, Abraham journeyed into a strange country. Well, didn't God appear to Abraham and tell him, go to a land that I will show you? Uh, every time in Hebrews 11, the person did something, it was in response to what God had commanded. It is no different with, with Abel. Abel brought what God told him in the right frame of mind, so his offering was right, but Abel was also right. By contrast, uh, uh, John declares to us that Cain's works were evil. In, in 1 John 3, verse 12, the Bible says, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. Now, there might have been a whole lot of folk named Cain, but you know which Cain he's talking about. He talking about the Cain back in Genesis chapter 4. And why did he murder him? Now, he didn't murder him because he was mad at his brother for being the good son. He didn't murder him because God was playing favorites and should have accepted his sacrifice too. John tells us he murdered him because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, notice what he said about Cain. His works were evil. What does that mean? There was a problem, not just with what Cain brought. There was a problem with Cain. Now, consider John's declaration in the light of what we are told back here in Genesis 4, three through five. Now again, in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. We are told that Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock. But interestingly, no mention is made of the quality of Cain's offering. Because, you know, even the, the fruit of the ground uh, has, a, has a, a, a first part to it. Uh, it has some that's better than the rest of it. It has a portion that, that I'm giving God even before I take any uh, uh, for myself. And observe that the offering is mentioned in conjunction with the offerer. Now, I submit to you that what I offer to God stems from my estimation of God and my appreciation for him. You know, every Sunday we have the opportunity to give. What we give, each of us individually, is based on what I think about God and how thankful I am for God's blessings. Now, if I just scrape together some leftovers and give that to God, then it says, I don't think much of you, Lord, and I'm not very grateful for what you have done. Now, you can say what you want to. Jesus said, by their fruit, you will know them. It's not how I say I feel that tells you who I am. It's watching what I do that will tell you what I am. David his estimation of God and his appreciation for God was such, we read in 2 Samuel 24, verse 24, then the king, meaning David, said to Arana, now, now just to give you some backdrop on, on what was going on, Israel had been suffering for something David had done. God relented on the punishment on Israel, but David needed to offer a sacrifice because of God's mercy. Well, when he goes to offer the sacrifice, Arana says, well, whatever you need, I just give it to you. Notice what David said when, when Arana offered to just give it to him. David said, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels, uh, of silver. In other words, David said, 
my worship of God, my service to God is not a matter of convenience. I'm not going to offer God something that somebody just gave to me. I, I think more of God than that. I, I'm more thankful to God for his grace and mercy than to just give him something that was given to me. That that didn't cost me anything. Now, there's a lesson there for us. We ought not try to serve God and worship God as a matter of convenience. Uh, you know, if, if I come to the, the, the eight o'clock service, because after eight o'clock is over, I got the whole rest of the day to myself. See, what you're saying is, I'm coming to eight o'clock because it's convenient. I give God an hour and a half and I got the whole rest of the day to myself. Now, I, you hear at 1030 say, well, that ain't me because I didn't get up at eight o'clock and say I got to. Well, what if you decided I'm a sleep in and I don't have to get up till late? And I could still be there on time at 1030. Well, you're just as convenient as the eight o'clock. I'm not worshiping God because he's worthy of praise. I'm making it convenient at a time that suits me. Now, if you're really bad, you say, you know what? They got evening service and I don't start till six. Man, I could sleep in. The evening service shorter than both the morning services. I could be in there and out in an hour. The Bible articulates that Abel offered to God the first and best of what he had. But the same thing is not said of Cain. But then if we look further here at Genesis chapter 4, uh, uh, again there at, at verses 6 and 7. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. I, I submit to you that not only did Cain fail to honor God, but Cain valued self more than service. Appreciate again the questions that God asked are, are for the purpose of promoting introspection. What Cain needed to do was examine the attitude of his heart rather than boil with envy and jealousy uh, against his brother. And, and let me give you a, a quick side note since we pass in through here. People will hate you simply because you do what's right. You won't make somebody mad, and I ain't saying who, but you won't make somebody mad, just do the right thing. Let, 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 let me give you a, a, a for instance. Hebrews 13, 17 tells us, obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your soul. Now, what Paul was saying is cooperate with the elders because they have a big responsibility. They watch for your soul. Now, now, the Hebrew writer wasn't saying you agree with everything that the elders decide, but he did say cooperate with them. Now, cooperate with the elders and watch some uncooperative soul take exception to the fact that you are cooperating. Why you wanna be a yes man for them? Well, well, maybe I'm not being a yes man, maybe I'm just trying to do what God said. God said, obey them that have the rule over you. The, the wise man tells us in Proverbs 29, 27, an unjust man is an abomination to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. People will hate you simply because you do what is right. But appreciate, I'm not wrong because somebody else did what was right. I'm wrong when I don't do the right thing in the first place. See, now the fact that you did right when I'm doing wrong might cause people to take more notice of my wrong, but the problem is not that you did right, the problem is I wasn't doing right. The omission of a description of the quality of Cain's offering cannot be dismissed. Now, I get Cain and Abel lived prior to the law of Moses, and certainly they lived before the Christian era. But an acceptable offering to the Lord is always of the first and best. Now, you find it many times in the Old Testament, but on one occasion when God told Israel about coming to appear before him, the, the, the three big feasts that they observed, one of the things that was stressed 
is that they were to bring the first fruits of their labors. It didn't have to, it wasn't always a blood offering, but whatever you brought had to be of the first and the best. The charge to the Corinthians was that their benevolence was to be proportionate to their ability and not an afterthought. In, in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so the rule for one church was the rule for all of them. So you must do also. Now notice what Paul says in verse 2. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside. In other words, you ain't supposed to just scrape leftovers together and offer them to God and then think God is going to be pleased. Now I know God doesn't need what we have and in reality, what we have is really God's. It's just ours by stewardship. Each one of you is to lay something aside. Then watch this next phrase. Storing up as he may prosper. There is to be a proportion between what I give to what God has blessed me to receive. Even under the law, there was a proportion. Now, under the law, we call the proportion tithing. They gave a tenth. Well, now, guess what? The more you made, the more the tenth was. The person who made $100, well, a tenth of $100 is less than a tenth of $1,000. Well, Paul says there, storing up as he may prosper. In other words, what you give is to be in proportion to what God has bl blessed you to receive. Nobody is free to just give God what you want them to have. Yeah, I don't think very much of you, Lord. You, you bless me to earn, uh, a, 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 you know, a big old paycheck, $200,000 a year, and, and I'm going to come in and drop five bucks in the collection. Well, shame on you. I mean, I don't think very much of God and, and what he is doing for me and allowing me to be blessed the way that I am. Service or worship that is offered of convenience, or as David said, that doesn't cost me anything. Service or worship that is offered of convenience is sacrilege. Now, if you don't know what sacrilege is, the dictionary says sacrilege is the violation or misuse of what is regarded as sacred. Now, the sons of Aaron were guilty uh, uh, of sacrilege, Nadab, Nadab and Abihu, they were guilty of sacrilege by offering strange fire to the Lord. Now, you go back and read that in Leviticus 10. And when they offered strange fire, God sent out fire that consumed them. And then on top of that, God told their daddy, Aaron, you better not cry for him. Woo. My boys were slain and I can't even mourn. That's, you better straighten your face up. And look, they, they should have been committing sacrilege. The sons of Eli, uh, 1 Samuel 2, 12 through 17, the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, committed sacrilege by profaning the offerings of the Lord. And they got in trouble too. Uh, which just says, you treading on thin ice when you value self more than service. But then third there in uh, Genesis chapter 4, in verse number 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Reading what someone has said is not the same thing as hearing what they said. In reading, tone and manner are not always appreciated. But when you hear somebody talk, you catch their tone and matter by virtue of the fact that you're listening to them. The sarcasm of Cain's response is not readily appreciated when you read this. You know, when you read this, the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Now, Cain didn't go, I don't know. I, it's a mystery to me. Cain was more, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? How should I know where he is? It ain't my business to be watching, up, uh, watching out for him. And he was blatantly defiant in asking, am I my brother's keeper? He was talking to God. 
Now, if you have been raised properly, you know that there is a certain way that you talk to certain people. If you have been raised properly, you have been taught to respect your elders. There's a certain way you do and do not, as a child, talk to adults. Now, for a matter, there's a certain way that adults ought to talk to adults. But, but, but if you were raised right, when, when it's talk, somebody you ought to respect, it's just a way you do not talk to them. I was raised when I was coming up, if an adult lied on you, I mean just flat lied, one of, one of them bold-faced lies. If an adult flat lied on you, what you could not do was tell the adult you lying. Now, they might have been. But see, now the issue is no more that they have said something untrue. The issue is you have responded disrespectfully. Now, even if they were lying on you, now you're in trouble because you talk to them disrespectfully. The Bible tells us, uh, uh, I missed the point. Cain refused accountability and respons uh, responsibility, got caught up. Uh, there we go. 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 2. The Bible says, do not rebuke an older man. Now, some translations render that, do not rebuke an elder. An elder in this context is not elder as some of our brothers uh, are gracious enough to serve as uh, uh, in this congregation. And we see that because it's contrasted over against the younger man. Now, it would include our elders where we ought to speak respectfully to them, too. But notice what Paul says: do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Now, how you talk to your father? Do, do you just go up to your father and tell him, you a lie? It, 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 no, not if you raised in a proper house. That, that ain't how you talk to your daddy. Look, that's, man, you, might well go, you, know, that, that, you might well go sign your uh, death certificate. It, go talking like that. Uh, it, it, you know, if you raised in a proper house, you, you can't even bass at your daddy. Yeah? You better take some of that bass out your voice. Uh, you know, there, there's a certain way you talk to your mother. Who who you coming at with all that attitude? Eh? You, you, you better ease up some uh, because it's out of place. Look, I'm trying to use too much slang. It's out of place to, to talk disrespectfully uh, uh, to certain people. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, young men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. Now, Paul is saying it's a right way to talk to everybody. I don't care who they are. Uh, you know, it, as, as an adult, you know, if I was just talking to Brother Ford, I, it, now, Brother Ford's an adult too. Now, now yeah, you know, I'm going to talk to him different than I might talk to, to my child. You know, I talk, imagine me and Brother Ford, we talking and we just disagree on something. And I say to him, well, you know what, Joe, that's all I got to say on the subject. <laughs> yeah, well, whose daddy are you? Now, I can talk like that to my children. I, you, look, that's all I'm going to say on the subject. And guess what? We through talking. I'm through talking and you through talking, too. Unless you just want to go spend some hot time in the hospital. Because that's the authority God gives me uh, uh, over, over a child. The context in 1 Timothy 5 indicates that it's age and not the position of service that's being held in view. Now, appreciate, Paul is not saying that older people can't be wrong. What he is saying is that there is an appropriate way to address an older person. Now, if such respect is to be shown to an older person, how much more respect should be shown to God? Right. You know, Cain talking about, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, first of all, Cain, who you think you're talking to? Look, I'm not one of your playmates. Hey, yeah, look, yeah, we need to start over again because this ain't going to end well for you with, 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 with all that attitude uh, uh, in your voice. I like verse 10 there in chapter 4. Because God didn't dignify Cain's question with an answer. You know, he didn't go back and forth with Cain. You know, Cain, am I my brother's keeper? God didn't even bother to, to, to answer that. God just simply says to Cain in, in, in verse 10, what have you done? Now, again, I, 
He's not trying to figure out what happened. God knows what happened. He can't. Do you appreciate how you have messed up? What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me uh, uh, from the ground. Why didn't God go back and forth with Cain? Because Cain needed to respect God's authority and God's person. And there's a great lesson uh, uh, in that for those of us that are parents. Now, let me be very, very careful to say there are times and things that we need to discuss with our children. I'm not just saying just go and just, you know, run your household and children can't say anything. I'm not advocating that at all. There, there are times when we need to have a discussion. But the child needs to be taught to respect the parent's person and authority. Appreciate, as the parent, God has given you authority over your children. Uh, uh, Ephesians 6, 1, the Bible says, children... Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, notice he didn't say parents obey your children in the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Your parents have a certain authority over you. And I don't care how old you get, your parents never stop being your parents. Now, I'm grown and gone, got children and grandchildren. But I still talk to my mother a certain way because she never stops being my parent. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. If your child respects your authority and your person, you don't have to argue with your child about the rules in the house and, and how things are going to be. Do you know God doesn't argue with us? God says, I'm in control of the universe. I'm not gonna argue with you about anything. John 12, verse 48, Jesus says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. Now, what is Jesus saying? You can reject the word of God if you want to and go on with your grown self and do what you want to do. But guess what? You still gonna have to answer to the word of God. It's still the standard that you're gonna be judged by. Jesus, I'm just not going to argue with you. I've, I've spoken. I, look, I've said what I said. Now, you can either obey or disobey, but there are consequences based on the choice that you make. God's message to Cain was, number one, Cain, I know what you did. And number two, you may not want to be accountable or responsible for what you did, but you are. I say, I don't have to argue with you about whether or not you're going to pay some consequence for what you did. You just are. I'm not trying to find out what you did. I knew that before I asked you where Abel was. I know you killed him, and you know you killed him too. And since you won't be so flippant uh, about it, uh, you, you, know, you ever punish the child more than you was going to punish him because of the way they responded? You know, then Cain got nerved, and now he won't cry to victim. My punishment is more than I can bear. Well, you should have thought about that before you killed your brother. I tried to warn you. I told you. If you do well, you'll be accepted just like your brother. Now, you weren't trying to hear that. You went on out and did what you wanted to do. Now, you got to pay the consequences for what you did. The grace and mercy of God is seen in the fact that while God does not remove consequences necessarily, he is willing to remove the penalty for the wrong that we've done. He causes the gospel message to be preached. We need to hear the gospel message, the good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and raised the third day for our justification. When we hear that gospel message, Romans 10, 17, we need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John 8, verse 24. Because we believe, we must be willing to turn from sin. The Bible word for that is repent. Uh, God commands all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, 30, 31. We must be willing to make the confession of faith that we believe Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. 
then we must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins as an obedient response to the gospel message. In Acts chapter 2, the first time the gospel message was preached, there were those that heard the gospel declared. And in verse 37, they asked the question, what is it that we must do to be right with God? In Acts 2.38, Peter responded, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we submit to the command of God to be baptized, in the waters of baptism, God washes away our sins by the blood of Christ Jesus, puts his spirit inside of us, and adds us to the church. And when we come up out of the waters of baptism, the command of God is that we live faithfully in his service. Revelation 2, verse 10. If you're listening to this message via one of the social media outlets, uh, your desire is to be baptized into Christ Jesus, then we bid you reach out to our elders at elders, as Brother Pratt mentioned, elders with an S, elders at laurelchurch.net. Now, if you don't put the S on it, it's going to be out in cyberspace somewhere. <laughs> elders at laurelchurch.net, they will be happy to make provision uh, for you to be baptized. If you are here in our audience, uh, this is your desire, then we bid you to come as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.